Mm-hmm. Watch. I didn't really do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it, I thought it was going to. Oh, there we go. There we go. I got the uh, I got the the UGG sneakers on. Can't say enough about UGGs. UGGs, they're they're nice. They're very nice. Let's get it rocking, bro. I'm feeling good. I mean, it's sunny out. Yeah, it's gonna be a great day. All right, let's. Uh, let's Are we hot mic'd already? Yeah, we're hot mic'd. You always get me. Well, it's always good. Well, it's like sunny out, and I had a good morning, so and a great weekend. It's thus far, let me adjust that. All right, I think uh, I think we're ready to rock and roll here. Let's go. You want to introduce? Her? I'll do it. I'll do it. Two in a row for you, man. Two in a row. Build momentum. I'm, I'm building a streak. Welcome to another episode of Unscripted Exchanges. I'm your host, Cole. And I'm Hayden Huber, the co-host for today. Do you notice how I did that? I said host, not co-host? Yeah, that's why I had to switch my... Thank you. My <laughs> I had to get that in. I've been thinking about that ever since he did to me last episode. Uh, thank you guys again for joining us today. We are excited to be releasing another episode. I think there's some great conversations about to come out of this. I know I'm feeling a little bit more relaxed and focused today. So I don't know what it is, maybe a combination of a lot of things, but I know we've got some exciting content. I think uh, we're feeling a little bit more relaxed. Is It's because we just had a nice conversation about our strategy and where we're looking to go. Yeah, can I share like a little bit of that? Yeah, share what you well, want to share. Well, I think but... there was something to take out of that. Yeah. We we had a discussion about uh, setting goals, setting uh, setting boundaries, and also just being able to um, hold each other accountable to certain things. And I think uh, it was just an awesome conversation. I think it's going to it's gonna yield really positive results. So it one thing I'll point out uh, for anybody that's listening to this that is thinking about starting a venture or or starting a project or getting into something where it's going to take another either partner or partners. Um, one thing I would say that I'm learning about uh, this relationship uh, Hayden and I have is you've got to pick wisely. Sometimes you just get lucky where you, and I think I'm lucky. I honestly think I'm lucky. Uh, so don't take that. Don't, don't put your head's getting a little big here, but I will say I got super lucky with this. So I would, I would give some quick advices uh, choose wisely. Um, think about not just uh, the vanity things of oh they they've run a successful business or they have a lot of money or they they're good look whatever the the met the, the the thing on the outside is but think about are they going to to take criticism uh, well are they going to share and have an open line of communication what are their goals uh, not just goals as in financial goals but goals for like their personal well-being and their own life. I think there's a lot of things you can dive into. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of, you know, Hayden with us, I'm just seeing a lot of, of progress and good things to come. So just wanted to share that for you listeners and a uh, little tidbit of advice on that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you actually bringing that up. I, I think why we get along so well and why we are going to continue to thrive is we have really good communication with one another. Um, and that communication is only going to improve over time, but we're very transparent with one another. Uh, we're trying to not take things personally, uh, which we don't, uh, but at least recognizing, cause I think I was a little bit, uh, concerned that maybe some of the feedback that I provided, uh, you, uh, might've, you know, rubbed you the wrong way and vice versa, but just having those, you know, open lines of communication, we're both again, very passionate and excited about this venture and some other things that we're looking to do. Uh, so again, very good conversation that we had. Um, and like you said, the, the best is yet to be, and there's some, some good things, uh, in the works. Amen, brother. Amen. So today we wanted to kick off a conversation, 
uh, about, I think specifically about finances and just some stuff that we have learned. Again, we're, you know, we don't have everything figured out and we try not to say that as much, but we don't, you know, we've learned a lot of things along the way. I know I have, I know Hayden has. We're here to share our personal We're here to share some, too. some experience, some um, knowledge, uh, some do's and don'ts. So For sure. Maybe some more don'ts. Yeah, so maybe a few more don'ts, but uh, I think we're going to just kick it off and kind of jump into a few different lessons you can learn and things, little neat tricks you could do to uh, at, at a young age. Again, some of this stuff is going to sound like cookie cutter. I could have read a five, stance, five steps to be financially well off book. Um, these are not just out of a book. These are just real life experiences we've got. But... We're also making the assumption that everyone has heard what we know, and maybe that's not the case. So exactly. it's always good worth sharing. Exactly. Do you want to dive on in, or do you want me to start? I was going to let you start, because it was, it was your topic that I liked, but I'm going to kind of kind of roll with it. For sure. So finances are really important to understand at a young age. I don't think there is really a age where you are too young to begin learning the ends and the outs of personal finances. I remember my parents teaching me a lot of good lessons early on, uh, some of which I think might be outdated to some extent, but you know what a lot of parents do uh, with their children is, hey, are you saving up? Are you putting that money in your piggy bank? Uh, so just bringing you guys along on my early days or my journey, it was always, okay, let's make sure, excuse me, that you are saving up you are not spending more than you're bringing in. And obviously when I was a little kid, like, what are you talking about? You don't have a job. Sure. But just doing chores around the house, you know, I was fortunate enough where my parents would, you know, give me $10, uh, every now and then I'm not going to say it was a, uh, consistent thing, but, uh, you know, every, uh, time that I got money, it was always, okay, Hayden, are you putting that in your, your bank account? It's always very important to save. You don't want to go out and you don't, you don't want to go turn around and spend that immediately. That's just not a good habit to have. So that was like one of the first lessons that I learned um, when it came to personal finances. And then obviously, as I got older, I learned a lot more uh, pretty quickly. Um, but I think understanding your finances at an early age is just going to set you up for future success. I know the saying out there is money doesn't buy you happiness, but it can certainly help. It and certainly it can do a lot of other things too. So it's, it's really important. <laughs> so let me ask you this, cause you're talking about being a kid and you know, obviously I'm a parent, so I've got, I'm, I'm, we had this conversation earlier, but obviously I'm still trying to learn like, you know, my daughter, my oldest daughter is at this age where you know she's she knows a lot right she knows a lot she's she's very opinionated and she's very much you know kind of molding herself and i'm trying to be an influence in her life as well and help mold that and instill um different you know uh goals and aspirations but also instill like uh certain um characteristic traits that i believe will help her live a, a fulfilling life and so speaking specifically about finances, Hayden, you said that your parents communicated to you like, hey, you know, put that money in your sa- piggy bank, put that money in savings. Did you ever, did your parents ever, I'm just asking, like, were there any specific examples of where your parents were like, hey, you know, you want this, so you're going to have to save up for it. And what did that teach you? Yeah, um, I do recall one instance of that Um I was a little bit older at the time, um, at least in my mind. I was in eighth grade, and I wanted the new video console. I believe it was a Wii. Oh, the yeah. Nintendo Wii. Um, and obviously, I didn't have enough funds to, to purchase it. And, you know, I asked my parents for it, and they're like, no, we're not buying you one. Uh, so what I did was I took the opportunity to shovel a whole bunch of driveways um, and collect uh yeah like a couple hundred dollars i mean there was a big snowfall for a couple of days consistently (laughs) but i mean charging like 20 to 40 dollars a pop depending on the size Mm -hmm. of the driveway i mean that's only you know if i can do basic math let's say it was 20 dollars a driveway for the smaller driveways which i think it was and i did 10 of those that's 200 dollars but I think we charge even a little bit more for the larger ones anyways i'm getting into the granularity there but i uh you know Saved up all that money from two or three days of shoveling snow 
and I was able to have the, the funds to purchase the Wii. So basically what that taught me is, one, you got to understand, you know, what it is that you want. Two, how are you going to, you know, have the funds or the capital to get to what you want? Um, in that instance, you know, I had to put in, you know, long hours and hard work of manual labor, shoveling driveways. Um, so it really taught me, um, which I knew earlier on too, but just the, the value of, you know, a dollar, it's not easy, uh, you know, going out and getting what you want. You can't just say, Hey, I want X, Y, and Z, and it's going to magically be right. given to you. Um, and my parents always taught me that, uh, growing up way before, you know, that, that eighth grade, uh, example there, but you know, you got to be smart with your money. You got to save your money, which I know I just said earlier on. Um, but it's going to take some time and, you know, money doesn't grow on trees was something that my parents always preached. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think I'm going to, I'm going to jump in because, one of the points I kind of wanted to make as you're talking about this and we're, and I want to draw a correlation is, you know, obviously, so I got Ava and we've, we're teaching her, um, about, you know, she saved up money to get the horse. Right. Yeah. And, and buy stuff for the horse. And, you know, she was doing, she was going around asking neighbors if she could, uh, help rake their leaves in their backyard. I told her like, I'll walk up with you, but if you want some money, you know, go out, go out and, you know, go out and work for it, which is a great lesson to teach. But also, I wanted to draw a correlation to uh, this simple, simple thing that you learn as a young child, a, a kid in life, if your parents have taught you it, that we seem to, we tend to forget as we get older and we get into college. And a, a lot of us do this, and I've been in this situation before. I've been down this road where, you know, as a young kid, you're taught, go work for the money. Once you have enough cash, right, cash in hand, then you can go buy it, right? So you get 200 bucks, whatever it was, and you can go buy the Wii. You had that money. You had that green, right? That physical cash. Yep. You get 18, 19, 20, and you're, getting, you're in college and out of college, and guess what you start getting in the mail? Credit card offers. Credit card offers everywhere. You get every, anybody and everybody, it's crazy because when you're, when you're in college and you're $100,000 in student debt, they'll give you plenty of money to go to school as long as you've got good grades. You can go get loans from, you know, federal loans from anywhere. Here's $100,000 to use. Oh, and by the way, we know you're already in debt and you don't have a job, but we're going to give you $15,000 more on credit cards at like a 3% or 0% interest even. Yeah, come spend more money. And it's so easy. It's so easy to buy into that. And what we tend to forget is that simple, simple lesson that you learned as a kid that if you don't have the money, then you probably shouldn't spend it. But it makes it, we lose that as we get older and we have all these people offering us money, right? You got these credit card offers. And so one of the lessons I wanted to tie into that is a lesson I learned the hard way. And the lesson I learned the hard way is when I was 19 and I was having my first daughter and I was I just gotten a job. Well, I, you know, I wasn't great at budgeting. Mm -hmm. I wasn't great at budgeting. I I really didn't know. I mean, you you knew you you like okay. I know I got to make this much money, but then you start getting credit cards offers in the mail, right? And so it was really easy to say, okay, well, my credit score is eight eight hundred because I've got some student loans and I've got I, you know I think my parents opened a credit card for me at one point and sure. were paying it off, so I had like a clean record. So I was getting like you know. Five thousand dollars for this credit card, or five for this, and it was super easy money to spend <laughs> because I, it wasn't my money, I, you know. And so I started living outside of my means at that age. Now, granted, was there some ancillary? Yeah, I could, I could make all excuses in the book. Well, I had uh, I had a daughter. I was young. I was this and that, but I got into credit card debt because I didn't understand how to budget, and I also it, it was super easy to spend money that I didn't already have. Um, and so I guess the lesson, you know, I've climbed myself out of that hole as I've gotten older by being disciplined, um, by understanding that, you know, again, don't spend more than you make, uh, credit is a gr credit cards and credit is a great tool to use as long as you can pay it back. Yep. But if you're spending that much more than you're making and you're using it for the, again, for the nice car or this or that, and you're not, and you can't afford it, um, 
it's it's it, it, you can dig yourself in a hole. So I just think it's it's interesting how you go from younger in life where everything like when your parents are teaching you, you know, save the cash to buy something, and then you like get older and it's like sometimes it sticks. A lot of people it sticks with, but it's, it makes it life and, and the outside world makes it super easy to forget that simple like that simple adage of like don't spend more than you make. Right? Yeah, which I think is silly and or, or sad that uh, people forget that or they don't fully comprehend that i mean literally why are you spending money i mean i am being judgmental here why are you spending money that you don't have Mm -hmm. i mean there might be some very very small use cases or examples for why that could be the case but there are plenty of people out there blowing through money yeah racking up credit card debt i'm telling you to what prove to people that they've got the you know newest you know clothes electronics whatever it might be uh, again, I, I got very judgmental there, but the point being is there's no, 98% of the time, there should be no reason why you're spending more than you're bringing in. Well, or if you're spending it, again, like credit cards, for instance, again, I'm a big believer that, you know, I put my I put my subscript subscriptions and I put a lot of like my, my flights and stuff, they go on credit cards. I pay them off right away, but I do that because there's this other lesson I learned that, you know, your credit... You're not re- you're not liable for the money if somebody steals your credit card number, but you're liable if somebody steals your money from your bank account. So that's that's just a totally different topic. But I would say um, no, that's a great lesson, and I wanted to touch on that. Too. Yeah, like that, the benefits of credit cards are also really important. To yeah, understand too a financial institution. So word of the wise out there, if you didn't know this, you know, if you got a credit card and you're traveling overseas or out of the country or on a, on a trip or something, it's a great time to use it because you're swiping your card so many different places that your your chip number, your card number can get stolen or you can lose it um, and somebody can go out and start swiping it. But because it's a credit line leased from, your, from the bank, the bank is liable for that. You are not. If you're swiping your debit card everywhere, that's your money in your bank. And nine times out of ten, banks actually will not give you your money back for that. That's a great lesson to share, Cole. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I mean, I, over the last, let's say, ten years, ever since I went off to college, um, that shows you my age. (laughs) You're old. Uh, I know. I'm so old over here. Um, I haven't used a debit card in like ten years. Mm -hmm. No joke. And the other benefit to having a credit card, again, as, as you mentioned, it, it saves you in those instances with credit card fraud. You know, the institution is, you know, responsible for making amends and it's not actually being money stolen from your savings account right. directly. But you get points back for a lot of these credit cards these days. And like it's, cash it's, back and stuff? Yeah, it's, it's free money is how I look at it. Mm-hmm. Um so I'll open up a new credit card, let's say every 12 months or so, 12 to 18 months. And there's usually, you know, zero APR for the first 12 months all the way up to I've seen cards uh, for 18 months, which means that you can spend, you know, uh, whatever your line of credit is, which I recommend not using up the entire line of credit. Yeah, the but, rule of thumb is what? 30, 30 or 35% yeah, that and about, under is what you want to have. As your balance is like at all times. Your credit utilization. Yeah. Or, yeah. But you, you basically uh, can spend, yeah, you know, X amount of dollars on that line of credit. And then as I said, and some of this is going to be just basic to some people, but to some it might not be, where zero APR means you put $100, let's say, on that credit card. You don't have to pay the full $100, you know, the next month. They'll give you, you know, the 12 months or whatever the APR Mm -hmm. terms are to pay that in monthly installments. And as long as you're paying that amount, you're not going to get charged any pers- interest. any interest, right? Yeah, and credit card interest though is asinine. <laughs> it's, like it's, it's it's so high, and that's where people do get into trouble. And they yeah. got to understand that. Okay, I think like introductory rates are anywhere from like seventeen to twenty four percent, and they can get even higher. Yeah, 20- and that's where it just compounds, and you'll be paying like a ridiculous amount. And that's where you have to be careful. But understanding that if you open up a new credit card and it's got, you know, an introductory uh, 0% APR rate for X amount of time, that's good. And just making sure that you're consistently paying that monthly rate. So you're not paying any additional interest. Paying interest is silly. Yeah. And to the, and to your point again, the benefits of it, but remember that is still money you have. Like 
we're not saying that's not money. You have to, like you still have to pay that money back. Oh yeah, yeah, and and I think that's I think that's just a, a big thing to re hit. Th- yeah, thank thank you for helping me. Uh, uh, you still you, I didn't answer my my entire thought process well, there with basically what I'm getting at though of not using the credit card or the debit card for the last ten years is I've used my credit card as a debit card mm-hmm. where that I know that if I'm putting a hundred dollars on here I have to turn around and pay, pay that hundred dollars off exactly. And the benefit, though, to that is, again, accruing those points. So if I get 1% cash back, which at the time might not seem like a lot, I'm getting a dollar back. But that adds up to me. But if you're putting everything on your credit card, that's a lot of cash back. Yeah, I I think that I've definitely made um, a few thousand dollars over the past 10, 10 years, every bit. Dude, I uh, I love that. I love, love, love that lesson because, especially that point, like you said, so it's almost in a sense i mean a low 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 yield investment account for sure but it's a, i mean if you get the right card with the right financial institution as long as you're paying it back especially the points cards yeah i mean dude you can make money it's, off your own money exactly. you're you're making money by spending money you're making money but you've got it again again we we're good on the rabbit hole of this but um one of the i think the key point to hit there is credit cards and that cuz there's something else i want to kind of move into sure but Credit cards can be very, very, very good, but be careful, especially when you're younger. So any of our young listeners out there, even our older listeners, wherever phase of life you're in, you can get in big trouble. And and at a younger age, I'm speaking specifically to that from experience, is that once you get, you know, let's say, let's say you get five or six grand, which is doesn't sound like a lot, but it's five or six thousand dollars in credit card debt. It takes you three or four years to dig yourself out of that hole unless you just go blow it, right? And especially if you miss a payment when you're first starting off on credit, you can really, really, really screw yourself. So when you're starting off, it's great to go open a credit card or get that, but make sure you're thinking through like, okay, what am I going to use this for? When am I going to use it? And make sure you can pay it off. Yeah, to add on to that, it might be good to have a co-signer to start with your first credit card. Um, usually that's, you know, your legal guardian, such as your parent. Uh, but yeah, I, I think we holistically covered some of the pros and the cons there. Again, very important to make sure you understand the the downsides to credit cards or a line of credit versus then some of the, the pros that mm-hmm. we, we highlighted here, um, which I think are super important to understand as well because... You want to make your money work for you at the uh, end of the day. As I tell people, if there's $200 laying on the ground there, would you pick it up? 100%. Yeah. Unless it's on the highway from one of those uh, bank trucks. <laughs> you don't full. want to be picking that. I yeah. mean, you want to be picking it up, but you want to be returning Yeah, it. you give it back. You give yeah. it back. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, here's the other thing I wanted to jump into, Hayden. And this was a uh, conversation we had. Actually, we've had recently, like very recently. So you know... I'm looking at uh, getting a new new vehicle. Yep. Um, I my Chevrolet Malibu. I was planning on di- driving the tires off of this car uh, because I, you know, I just committed. I'm not buying. I bought my wife. Uh, Those my wife. are great and reliable cars. Sorry, I had to cut it. Yeah, there it, it, I it, had one for a few years. My dad's had one for about 10, 10 12 years now. So it, they're they're good cars. It is, and it's and it's had some issues over the past year and a half. Um, so, but I was like, you know what? We just bought my wife a, a Volkswagen Atlas, which is a really nice car, really nice, you know, luxury vehicle. And and it's like, okay, we bought a house, and I'm like, I just don't. I'm not gonna go in and buy another car. This car is reliable, right? Well, past six or seven months, started having some issues, and then it just, lack of a better term, like shit the bed, like a couple of weeks ago. It just, it got to the point where I I had to go take it in. To a, a shop, they said we can't touch this. You got to take it to your Chevrolet dealership. You know that's a bad sign when like your local shop says we can't fix it. You got to take it to the dealer. You're like, oh no. But I can't take my daughters in it, right, Hayden? Because like I can't have a car that could break down while I'm driving with a, a newborn. And so okay, so I'm in this predicament. So I took it in. They're like, it, it needs a lot of work. It, you know, something's wrong with the engine. There's some fuses out. Uh, it needs new this, this, and this. Uh, it's gonna be a few thousand dollars. Well. I've put some money and in, in stuff in it. So like, you know what? That just doesn't make sense to me at this time mm-hmm. to invest more money in that vehicle. Yep. But I don't want to just, I, I, I'm one of those people that has learned from life experience. I'm never going to let circumstances back me into a corner, mm-hmm. you know? So, oh, just because I have to get a new car, I need, I need to do something about this car. I'm not going to just go make a rush decision. Right. I don't, I, I, I can't, I, 
I'm like one of those people like the moment you try to make me rush a decision like that, I'll go the opposite way. Um, and I just, I don't like that. I don't like to just make unthought out decisions. It, it may, I lose sleep at night. I get anxiety. It just doesn't work. So I'm like, okay, I know I got to get, I, I decide I got to do something. I'm getting rid of this car. I, but I don't know if I'm going to buy a new vehicle. Yeah. Cause you can word of the wise, word of the wise, keep using that. But there are some really big benefits to buying new, especially if you're buying from like, you know, when they've got the, like forward's got their a program where you get 0% interest for like 72 months or you can buy, you know, they've got all these different things, and they give you big incentives to trade in a car and a new car. So there's some benefits to that. So I was like, I don't know if I want to buy new. What would I buy? Do I want to buy used? Which right now the market for a used vehicle is outrageous. Yep. Um, or do I want to lease? Right. So I've got three different options. I know I'm going to do something. And Hayden and I had this conversation. I went and uh, I went to a dealership and had them price me, uh, give, tell them what they give me for my car and price a new a new vehicle. Give me all the terms and everything like that. Uh, they tried to corner me, Hayden, by the way. They tried to, like, you know, sign on the dotted line, sign on the dotted line, sign on the line. We got everything you wanted. And I'm like, sorry. Again, for you listeners out there, don't ever, 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 ever let somebody pressure you into making a financial decision. Ever. It, because that is the if, – if you let somebody pressure you into buying a car, buying a house, buying a new computer, spending your money, if you let people pressure you into that – it's probably not going to end up end up well because I'd even say beyond just financial pressure, anything, anything, yeah. anything. But I'm I'm saying like especially in those circumstances when you go buy a car, buy a house or something, and somebody's like laying it on you. That's the time when you take a step back and you take the personal part out of it and you say, I'm not going to just do something because somebody's trying to make me do it. Yep. So I was getting really pressured and really stood on to buy this new car, and I'm like, I do. I'm like, no, absolutely no way. So, um. I'm, I'm talking around in circles, but one of the things I wanted to hit, and this is some, some feedback I got from Hayden, I wanted you to talk to it, is I said, okay, I called Hayden and I said, well, well, what do you think about leasing a car? So you lease, I'm like, you, I know you lease your your Jeep. Why do you lease the Jeep? What were the benefits? Um, and, and I want to get, so I guess my first question is, what are the benefits of leasing, leasing a vehicle? Like, why did you do it and what are the benefits of that? Man, now you're telling everyone what kind of car I drive. Oh, they're gonna I didn't tell them what me. kind of Jeep. I just said Jeep. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just being silly. Uh, Gladiator, though. It's sick. <laughs> it's sick. I think there are a few reasons why leasing is good for my situation, but I think they're also good for a lot of people. But I will preface things by saying it just depends on your situation, meaning are you married with kids? How much disposable income do you have? Um, yeah, the, the timing of the market, like you said, right now, buying a used car, you're probably going to be paying more than face value or market value, which is just absurd. Uh, but the mindset or philosophy that I've taken with leasing a car is one, uh, which this is more so, uh, anecdotal, which you could also tie into to some facts here. I would rather pay a little bit of a premium in terms of leasing a car that has the newest bells and whistles or features. Now, recognizing that I don't need to have every bell and whistle on the car is fine, but I'd rather pay a little bit of a premium uh, to have, you know, the latest safety features uh, and upgrade or lease to a new car, you know, every 36 months or whatever the lease terms are. So that's kind of my initial thinking in terms of, well, why do I want to lease a car um, and switch into a new car every couple of years? And it starts with that. I'd rather, you know, upgrade to a newer car with say safety features, et cetera. Uh, beyond that, it goes into cash flow and money. So the way that I looked at things when I was looking to buy a car versus lease the car. And again, this is where it depends on your personal situation with your finances. Um, there's a lot of different variables beyond, you know. Yeah, what you're saying is you got to look into like before you did it, you knew where you were at. Yeah, you, I was very analytical about that. I mean, I looked at the pricing for me with buying a used car versus, or just buying the car, uh, the, the brand new car versus leasing the car. The math just didn't make sense because I would be paying the same amount, if not more, on a used car that had, you know, less safety features, someone had driven it. I don't really know the car history, even though there's like car facts out there now where they promise you like, hey, this is everything that's been documented, yeah, which is that's great. Yeah, been documented. Right, but again, you're, you're taking on a used car, which again, it's, it's a liability. 
um, whether it's brand new or not, as soon as you drive it off the lot, you know, it loses uh, value. So instead of paying, and I'm just pulling random numbers here, $500 for a used car that at the end of the day, I can say that I own versus paying only $300 for a brand new lease car. It's like, well, I'm paying less for a brand new car. I don't get to keep the car. But to me, that was a big enough pro or benefit to lease the car. And again, looking at the example of those numbers there, I had an extra $200 each month or whatever the amount comes to right, be with right. each of your situations. I could do that to invest the money or pay off other bills that I had. So that's kind of my mindset on leasing a car. Mm -hmm. And the other great thing to leasing a car is you can still lease to own. Why tie up a whole bunch of money? Like why why put down $10,000, let's say, on a car when you can pay that off over time? It goes back to the example of having zero APR. Um, you know, spread out that money. Don't lock up all that money right away. As they say, cash is king. So I think that's another important lesson that I've uh, appreciated mm -hmm. is, okay, maybe I do want to buy this car, but I don't need to buy it right away. You know, I don't need to come up with, let's say the $10,000. I only need to come up with the down payment, which I think every single car that I've leased, and I've leased three, um, I have had a down payment of, I think, $0 every time, which is sometimes factored into the, the price, the monthly right, price of the right. lease. But I'm also very good about making sure that I'm not having to bring a lot of money to the table because I think that's just silly to tie up a whole bunch of cash. You're so spot on. You're so spot on. I, I, I want to hit your point. I want to kind of dive into the talking about specifically the money down thing. Yeah, yeah. So I think... You, you know, a lot of people have this this notion, and I've had the notion before, but I've learned pretty quickly that you think, well, I have to have ten grand or eight grand or fifteen grand or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And this is buying houses and buying cars. I'm, I'm two. Yeah, yeah. And um, I can tell you that nine times out of ten, actually ten times out of ten, you unless your credit score is like. Which again is another topic. Unless you have like a five hundred credit score, you know, if you're in that. S Really like that six fifty an up range is where you can get a zero down. You gotta be in that range to get zero down. I mean mm -hmm. nine most most financial institutions, if you're not at least six fifty they're not gonna take that risk. They won't yeah, they'll make you put something down most of the time. But good point. A lot of the times you'll go in and this is where taking your time and not just making a decision as bad as you want something comes in. So you can go in and say because I've I did this with a man called Amanda's Atlas. Uh -huh. You know, I went in and I told them I'm not putting anything down. Yep. I'm not putting zero down. I'm I had a trade in on her Tucson. I said, just so you know, I'm not putting anything down. This is where I want my payment to be. Yep. Um, make it work, right? Yep. So they said, okay, great. Factored everything in. They come back with a rate. And I said, okay, well, what do I have to put down to get it to get it down? I think it was like sixty or seventy bucks a month. And they were like, well, you'd have to put 10 grand down. And I said, okay, I don't want to do that. And they said, well, if you did this, you could put 1500 down. And I was like, well, that could be too. And she's going to down 60 bucks. Okay. So I put, I think it was like two grand down on it. Uh -huh. um, but when I bought my car, when I did it, I put zero down. Yeah. And I got a 3% interest rate. And so I, I guess I'm like going around a circle saying you don't, you don't necessarily have to come with a bunch of cash because a lot of the times, a bunch of cash, the moral of the story does not necessarily move the needle. Like ten thousand dollars versus two thousand dollars versus zero down. I mean, could be there between fifty or sixty bucks. But what if you wanted to spend that that five or six thousand dollars on upgrades to the vehicle or investments or other bills? Right, whatever it might be. Yeah, like is that fifty or sixty bucks that big of a deal? Same thing goes with a house. Buying a home, a lot of the times you have to put you have to put something down, but you don't have to put ten or twenty percent down. You can put a lot of conventional loans these days. If you have the credit score, you can put three to three and a half percent down. FHA loans, you put three percent down. Yep. Conventional loans, as long as you're over seven, I think it's seven hundred now. You can put three percent down. You don't have to put twenty percent down that everybody's been preaching. And a lot of the times, that cash can be used for positive things. Yep. Like just 
re uh investing in the home with upgrades like you can you know spend your money there which then you're building equity still on the home which would be equivalent to putting 10 to 20 percent down so i totally agree with that with the the house example going back to buying or leasing cars the other thing to recognize is no matter what number you give to car people and i always let them start with the number first i never throw out that number to me it's a game Uh uh-huh and I, I, I would like to say I'm pretty good at negotiate negotiation, um, and I'm, I'm somewhat ruthless, but in a respectful manner. They'll try to get you to say your number, meaning in the stance of what what do you want your monthly payments to be? Mm-hmm. If you say five hundred dollars, and again, I'm just using a random number, they'll be like, "Sure, we can get you to that." But what you have to understand is how much am I paying over the life of the lease or the the life of owning the car to pay it off? Uh-huh. Because they'll back you into anything. Easily. Yeah, they'll say they'll, they'll say, "Well, you can yeah. lease the car for forty eight months right, at five hundred dollars." Right. When it's like, "No, I want to lease it for you know five hundred dollars, but for only you know thirty months." Mm-hmm. Like you want to do the calculation and it goes back to your point of doing the research up front instead of buying it, you know, uh, sight on scene and being rushed into a decision. Like I don't play that game where they're trying to say, well, yeah, we can get that price down for you. They're not getting the price down for you. You're paying <laughs> more just over a longer period yeah, they're of just, time. They're just stretching it out. Yeah. So just recognizing that to some of the listeners out there who might not be too familiar with that. Um, don't, fall victim to to that trap there and also look at the residual of the car uh what's the price of it going to be uh after the uh loan is up that's also something to uh factor in um there's a lot you can learn from the uh car buying process too just in terms of yeah your negotiation skills uh just how you work with uh sales people um so i think it's a very good lesson to teach uh young people um you know, go, go out there and just start having those conversations, whether or not you're actually in the market to buy a car, just go out there and, and Dude, let it rip. See, see how you interact with those people see how they interact with you. You're and that so spot on. when you're ready to actually, you know, lease or buy a car, you'll be prepared and you won't have, you know, all this, uh, stress or feel pressure to do something because you kind of know what that, you know, experience is going to be like. And that's kind of how I behave. That's why I'm describing it this way is I would go out and do some, you know, investigation or research and kind of just how are these people like interacting with me? What are they trying to do? And again, I'm very analytical. I mean, I used to be an analyst, uh, for Kroger. Um, and and I just would make sure I am doing my due diligence. I'm asking the right questions and I want to fall victim. Oh, it's just a young guy that's coming in here. We're going to be able to sell him a car. We're going to make a huge profit. No, you're not going to let that that's not going to happen to me. Um, so I, I, I kind of flipped the script on them. Like I want the best deal. This is what the best deal means to me. I'm smart enough to know that y- you can't pull, you know, a lot of these, you know, things that you do to certain customers where they don't understand that you can just, you know, push out the the life of the loan. Well, they're just, you're, they're banging on you not doing the math. They're banging on you going, Oh, just being an uneducated or lazy yeah, customer. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. wanted to share that too, with any of the uh, listeners out there. But going back to the point around buying a home too, I, I think, yeah, that's that's another good area to dive into. Um, I think it's important to understand how long you're going to live in the home. And again, preface things by saying each you know person has their own situation, but my take on that is understanding how long you plan on living in the home. Meaning... If I'm going to buy, and again, using made up numbers here, a hundred thousand dollar home, I don't think I'm going to, and I'm not going to live in the house for more than let's say seven years, five to seven years. There's really no reason in my mind for why I should be putting down, you know, 20%, 30% or whatever. Like that's just silly because I'm not going to live in the house long enough. Um, Again, as you mentioned, I would rather have more money to spend on other things, whatever it might be. So I'll only put down the other 3% or the 5%, whatever, you know, the, the loan terms can be, uh, based on who you, you file your, your mortgage with. Um, so 
just kind of re-emphasizing Dude. your your point there, but it just you really got to start asking yourself, okay, how long am I going to be in the the home for? Like, what other expenses do I need to deal with? And that will kind of help you at least give you a ballpark in terms of like how much money you can put down. And sure, your financial advisors or your realtor, like some of those people can help you get into some of the more specifics. But just at a general level, it's kind of good to recognize that. Well, especially like to that point, just to follow up on that. Do the like do the math is what I would say to that. Like when you're looking at it, like okay, understand the situation you're in while you're buying it. Um, and any any big purchase, I think you got to understand like okay, I say that, but then like it's all relative. If there's like a car you really want and you just don't give a shit, go buy it. Like be my guest. I'm not saying every. I'm not saying we're not saying every single decision you make has to be so analytical. Yeah. But we're trying to give good advice to people that are trying to be make the smart decisions and um. Because most people fit into yeah. that bucket where yeah. they don't have all the money in that the world to go out and yeah. just not worry about but, whatever they're going to buy. And to that point, though, the smart people, even the rich, the wealthy, the very wealthy, they make smart decisions. They they're on their, they're wealthy and they stay wealthy because they're smart with their money. So it's all it's all take it with a grain of salt. But I think the uh, I was speaking to somebody a, a, a while ago when we bought our house and I was looking at doing a fifteen year mortgage and. He said, well, how long are you planning to live there? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, you know, we'll see. Um, anywhere from like five to five to seven years, probably maybe eight years. just depends. That's kind of where we want this house to, to be at this time frame. And when we bought it, we love our house, but it's kind of where we, we set our goals on. You know, we're going to upgrade in about five to, five to seven or eight years. He said, okay. Uh, so if you, you know, and so let's do the math. And we did the math on like what a 15-year mortgage would cost me versus a 30-year mortgage. And 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 what the benefits and pros and cons were and it actually like it sounded super smart at the time but i wasn't going to be there for all 15 years right so i was going to be spending a lot more per month and i was still not going to be getting that money that that much more money out of it versus going with a 30 year mortgage um so again taking that time to like sit down and go through the numbers you know it it, it sounded genius right oh i can cut it down in half i can afford it but really, like I wasn't. You look at like what I was making and what I was, what the actual numbers looked like monthly, and financially, the impact was like I'm gonna spend way more a month, but I'm still not gonna get that much more out of it when I sell the house and move on. Right. So I'm gonna burden myself now for really no reason. Right. Um, so again, it's like it, it, it's interesting when you start making look at those things and make decisions. Like Hayden said, it's when you start looking at the numbers and comparing them and understanding what part of life you're in and what phase you're in and what you want to get out of it. Um, don't just make a decision because it sounds like the right decision. Actually look at like what it's going to entail financially. For sure. And just to use an example uh, with what you described there, it's like, again, we'll use my $100,000 house price. You could put down 20%, so that would be $20,000, or you could put down as low as, let's say, like 3%. Again, there's some factors of variables for how yeah. that would be the, the case, but let's just go along with this. Like, the way that I look at it in terms of like the interest rate or yeah, doing a 15 year mortgage versus a 30 year is first understand what you would be paying over the life of the loan. So we'll do a 30 year example. Um, and again, these are just rough numbers that I'm throwing out here. So if it's a hundred thousand dollar home over 30 years, see what you would be paying over 30 years. Let's say it's $200,000. And again, these are just made up numbers. Right, right. Versus, okay, if I bump that down to 15 years, maybe instead of only having to pay $200,000 on a $100,000 home, I only have to pay $150,000. So yeah, I'm saving maybe $50,000, but that's over 30 years. And as you mentioned, if you're not living in the house long enough, it doesn't quite make sense. Yeah, you're putting in more equity into the home, so you're, you've got lower monthly payments, um, and you're paying more towards uh, principal, but again, those are like the situations where you start to get into the numbers, and we were just trying to walk you through an example of, okay, yeah, is it really worth fifty thousand dollars in savings? But again, I'm only accruing fifty thousand dollars if I stay there the whole time. Exactly. Yeah, if you stay there the entire time. Yep. That's where we. That's where we made the decision to go to thirty because it's like there was a, there was a time when you go, you go put it on an Excel sheet and, and calculate all the uh, all the what do know, they APR. call it the amortization schedule? Am, 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 yeah. Amortization. Amortization. <laughs> I'm not schedule. Act like I'm a 
if you look at that over, if you, when you compare them side by side, if we were going to say there, I think it was like 16 years and it made sense yeah. or, for, or something like that. They try but, to find the break even yeah, point for were, you or something. There was, but it was like, okay, but we're not going to live there that long. Yep. So we're going to be paying X amount more per month. Right. For, for really nothing. Exactly. For, for nothing. what reason? Yeah. Yeah. Just like putting the money down again, like I'm going to put more money down, but it only makes sense for X amount. Um, and also side note, even if you're only putting like three and a half percent or five percent, whatever, it's not literally three and a half percent. It's three and a half percent of the of the house plus your ta- all the taxes and documentation. Oh, sure. Plus sure. your realtor fees. Yep. Plus your closing fees. So that three and a half percent, just for first time home buyers and just to educate anybody that's looking at buying a house now uh, or or in the future, is when you're saving up. Don't just save that three and a half percent. You need to save like six percent to be able to even do that number. So yep. again, if you're saying, "Oh, I want to put twenty percent down," you're looking at more like twenty five or twenty six percent. If you're saying, "I'm going to put five percent down," you're looking at more like eight or nine percent because you've got a lot of fees and stuff that go into that. So again, you're just talking about whether you put a big chunk or a little chunk down. It's still you still got to factor that into it. Great point. There's other expenses that you need to take into consideration and that's where you shop around too but we'll we'll save those for for a later day if you guys enjoyed this episode i i mean i'm passionate about talking about personal finances i mean you got to be smart smart with your money you want to make your money work for you um let us know i would love to talk more about this on future episodes i think we wrap things up for today i mean this was a great start um cole and i were able to share some of our uh personal experiences the do's and the don'ts um and we could probably dive even a little bit deeper but again if you enjoyed this you want us to stay on uh this topic uh please continue to reach back out to us with feedback at unscripted exchanges at gmail.com we continue to great get great feedback we're very receptive to that feedback we want to listen to you guys and talk about the topics that you guys are most interested in um so yeah thank you as always for tuning on in uh this was a great episode i enjoyed it cole and uh i always enjoy it Hayden. oh yeah of course but we want to make sure that we're always uh extending our gratitude and thanks to you all uh, because without you guys this wouldn't be possible um please continue to share this with friends and family reach out to cole and i we really appreciate the support uh as we say here The best is yet to be at Unscripted Exchanges. Have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you for joining.